It said a picture is worth a thousand words. Pictures and video of extreme weather and natural disasters capture the power of nature, often showing us mind-boggling scenes that we did not even know were possible. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Hal, host of the GeoTrek podcast. Welcome to podcast number 79, a conversation I've had with Warren Fadley, America's premier storm photographer. Warren is an American adventurer, photojournalist, storm chaser, and disaster survival expert. He is officially credited as the first professional storm chasing photojournalist. You're going to love this episode, y'all. If you're adventurous, if you like traveling and exploring, and if you're into media, photography, and journalism, you're also going to love this journey I take with Warren as we talk about his adventures into all kinds of extreme weather and how the field of photojournalism has changed over time. If you're new to the podcast, GeoTrek explores the wor world, sharing stories about extreme weather and natural disasters not covered by the mainstream media. On the podcast, we explore the physical processes that create extreme weather and natural disasters, look at their impacts on society, and what we can do to get out ahead of these events to minimize their impacts. Hey, a big favor you can do, if you could subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts and all kinds of different platforms. That helps us mark professional progress, with helps, which helps us make uh, partnerships moving forward and ensures many more episodes of the GeoTrek podcast in the future. Well, without further introduction, let's get into this podcast number 79, a conversation with Warren Fadley. Warren, thank you so much for taking time to come on the GeoTrek podcast. Thanks for having me. Warren, so you're America's premier storm photographer. I have to ask, which really came first? Was it your love for photography or your love for storms, or did they kind of both come at the same time? Well, it was definitely a love for journalism, for being there, for seeing events as they happen as a journalist. That, that curiosity was number one. Photography came second and storms came third in, in the line of how this all happened. Oh, that's fascinating. So you were really interested to get out there and do good journalism, really capture events and kind of... Uh, you know, share and, and know and, and talk about and write about what's happening. Yeah, when I started this, there was no internet. There was print media and there was television. So you really had two ways and of course radio, but that was the only media you had back then. So as a photographer, to, to get a great photo, you knew that it could end up in a cover of a magazine, which back then was a mega, mega uh, accomplishment or to be featured on a, on a TV show like National Geographic or Discovery was a really big deal back then. I think people take it for granted now because of social media and anybody can can go on TikTok or any of the social media platforms and instantly present themselves. But back then it was, it was a lot different world. Warren, did a lot of your early journalism work, did it focus on environment and extreme weather or did you cover like geopolitical events as well and things like that? I covered everything <clears throat> from elections in Mexico where we were under machine gun fire to to large uh, fires, any kind of civil uh, disruption, disasters. That's what I f covered at first. I covered mainly things that were human related instead of things that were more natural based. Did you how did you get in like involved in journalism? Did you have an academic background in it? Is it just something you you kind of did, you know, you figure out as you went? Like how did you get involved in journalism? Well, it was it was kind of an accident. As I as I tell people, um, storm chasing didn't find me, as it finds a lot of people nowadays on social media, and people go, Wow, uh, I had to find it. But to get there, it's it's an interesting story because originally I wanted to fly. I wanted to fly jets for the Navy. That's what I wanted to do since I was very, very young. And right up until my junior year in college, that was my big plan. And that didn't work out because my eyesight went from like 2015 to 2030. And that was the end of the flight flight plans I had. So to get out of college, I wanted to get out of college as quick as I could. And someone said, well, have you ever tried photojournalism? And I'm like, what, what the heck is that? That doesn't sound exciting. So I tried and it was fun to go out with a camera and shoot all these crazy things. And one thing led to another. And I thought, well, this isn't too bad. So I ended up working for newspapers and magazines and eventually decided to, to ex expand that out into other areas. And, and of course, as we all know the story, it ended up being severe weather. 
Was there like an event early in your career that gave you traction, exposure that that kind of helped people discover you? I mean, was, is there one event that stands out to you that you covered that really helped people know who you were? Yeah, I think the, the event that really launched my career was when I captured a lightning bolt hitting a, a, a light pole in a tank farm, a oil and gasoline tank farm here in Tucson, which was about 400 feet away from me. And I knew I had an interesting shot, but uh, found out later it was at the time the closest high quality image anyone had ever taken of lightning hitting something. So it appeared in Life magazine. It was studied by NASA and some other scientists. And that really kind of got people interested in my work. I had people calling me when they saw the photograph in Life magazine. And I thought, well, maybe maybe there is a place for someone in the world to shoot just weather. There were other photographers shooting fashion and sports and news, but no one was specializing at the time in weather. So you talk about falling into to a market and being able to capture a market for, for 30 plus years. That was that was just a real stroke of luck. So had you not captured that photograph of that lightning strike, maybe you would have had a very different career, perhaps. I don't know, because after that, there were other other images I got of lightning and, and, and tornadoes and hurricanes. It kind of escalated from there. And you got to remember at that time, again, no Internet. It was a it was a wide open market to sell stock photography. And I really captured that that market overnight. And I was the go to guy for many years if someone needed a, an extreme weather image. So it sounds like you were really persistent with this. You were going out and at that point then really trying to find extreme weather. And it sounds like you were covering a lot of different types of extreme weather. What are the, especially early in your career, what were the main types of events that you were photographing? Well, back then it was it was really financially driven because chasing's always been expensive and very time consuming and even more so now. So the things back then were the graphics that people wanted for magazines. They wanted the bending palms in a hurricane. They didn't want to see flooding. They wanted certain graphic uh, things that the optics. They wanted tornadoes that looked very threatening. They wanted snowstorms where, where people were fighting through the blizzard. It was a very graphic based industry. And those images are, are hard to get, especially when you're just one person out there uh, trying to run this business. So it was a full time year round, 24 seven job for, for a good part of 30 years. So Warren, what, what are some of the biggest challenges you faced in getting out there and getting <laughs> extreme weather photography? Probably the biggest challenge would be just being in the right place at the right time. It's, it's nowadays you see so many images on social media. People think, wow, I, I could have been there. I should have been there. But it wasn't that easy back then. You, you didn't have all the forecasting tools. You didn't have radar. You didn't have laptops. It was it was very information based with the limit, limited amount of information you had it con combined with being at the right place at the right time and being in the position to take an image. And that that was difficult because it required a lot of time. You had to be there. If there was a hurricane somewhere in the Atlantic or in the Gulf, you really had to be there for days in advance to kind of position yourself. In the same way in the spring with, with severe weather, you had to basically stay in the plains for that whole period from the beginning to the end if you wanted to capture the right kind of images. Well, Warren, just think how smartphones have changed things, right? I remember my first professional hurricane chase. I was with the LSU <clears throat> Hurricane Center in 2008. None of us had smartphones. So we were calling back to Baton Rouge where someone would pull up a laptop and tell us what the storm was doing, right? I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of cases like that where maybe you were on the phone with someone who's looking at a computer image or, or watching the Weather Channel a bit back before smartphones, I would imagine. Yeah, we had these things called acoustic couplers, which you would hook up to a cell phone or to, excuse me, to a pay phone. And so you, sometimes you'd get a signal and sometimes you wouldn't. And sometimes it would print out this little map, this this little dot map thing. And it, as long as you could get, for example, a surface map back then, that was like a blessing. If you, if you could just see what the surface was doing, that would tell you a lot. And I think for chasing that, that helped me through my whole career because I'm able to look at things a little differently in the big picture than with all the data nowadays. There's a lot of things that people, I think, overlook because they didn't have that training back then. That's a good point. You had to do a lot with a little back then, and and I think probably hone those skill, those uh, forecasting skills. Yeah, there was you had no there was no alternative. You either 
either pay real close attention to that little bit of data you had and get the photo and get where you needed to be or you didn't. It was it was a do or die type situation as far as business goes. Warren, what type of extreme weather do you think is least photographed and why would you say that is? Probably. Well, nowadays, I think everything's photographed because you have a number of people on YouTube who present every single severe weather event, whether it's flooding or if it's, um, you know, tornadoes, hurricanes, a lot of things like heat. When you have these heat situations where people have a lot of problems with with uh, uh, heat, those those events generally aren't covered because a they're kind of hard to cover and b sure it's it's not very graphic. So when you have heat waves, I think that's probably the most under covered uh, weather hazard we have. You mean by contrast, a flood or a blizzard, it's very graphic. Like one photograph can tell the story of this extreme. You're saying like, that's a little harder to tell the story with, with extreme heat. Yeah. Extreme heat. People just kind of ignore it. Although a lot of people die of extreme heat. That's it's, it's just not graphic and it's, it just doesn't really present itself well on social media uh, platforms. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Like you said, uh, heat and cold too can have a lot of impacts, but maybe they're a little bit more difficult to photograph. Warren, I wanted to ask you, so what are the main values you keep at the forefront of your work? Like when, when you're out there in the field, you're trying to capture extreme weather on, on a, a photograph or an image. Uh, what are some of these goals that you have or priorities that you make when you get out there in the field to help guide your work? Well, the first priority I have is not to affect anyone negatively. That's my biggest goal when I'm out there. Am I going to be driving like a maniac, at least when there's anyone else around in, in danger? But my, that's my main goal is not to have a negative impact on anyone else and try to have the most positive impact I can have on other people. I don't really need to relay information. There's so many people out there nowadays, uh, the scientists, the uh, hobbyist chasers, uh, social media people. So it's kind of transitioned where Spotter reports are still important depending on the situation, but but my priority nowadays is, is just not to be part of the problem of too many chasers or, or endangering other people. That's that's my number one uh, goal when I'm out there. As a photographer, of course, I'm trying to capture the most extreme optics so people can see what these events do and, and I can learn and, and thus other people can learn. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like you said, sometimes it can get pretty busy out there, especially I think some of these severe weather and tornado chasers, you can get a lot of people in a small area. Um, it sounds like you're, you're trying to maybe kind of do your own thing, capture images that, that record the essence of this without maybe getting in people's way or in harm's way. Yeah, I don't want to be part of the growing growing problem, especially in the roads during the spring and in Tornado Alley. It's 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 crazy. It's absolutely nuts. And I don't want to do something where I'm going to have to have and I'm, I'm also an EMT. I don't want to do something that's going to require medical people to endanger themselves uh, to respond to me or other other people. And we're seeing that a lot more nowadays where we're chasers are taking these crazy risks. And it puts a lot of people in danger. I don't think they understand, not just themselves, but the people who have to come and, and rescue them. Warren, an extreme weather event moving into, say, a small town where you have the built environment, whether it's a tornado, a flood, anything like that, are there certain priorities that you have? Like, would you prefer to capture the impacts of this extreme weather on a, on a building? Or would you sometimes, are you looking more for like a photogenic um, just the, say the tornado by itself without the built environment? Like, how do you make those decisions? Well, I can't really, usually you can't de determine what you're going to shoot, especially with tornadoes. It happens there on the ground, I think average of less than 10 minutes. So you have to kind of, as a photographer, I try to find the right contrast, the right perspective to shoot from. You don't really have that opportunity with something like a hurricane. I can always position myself where you do have some infrastructure that you're trying to to capture and put into the into the pictures. Unfortunately, a lot of times that involves people who have not left the the area, which is always unfortunate. And you have animals and and other things. The infrastructure damage is always bad to see someone's home destroyed. But that's secondary to the people who who, who are affected, the people who stay there and wait till the last minute. And I hate to see that, but I always do whenever I chase hurricanes nowadays. And that's as even as a journalist, that's not something I really want to see. But it's just a part of, of the big picture as a journalist you can't avoid. 
Warren, if you have the opportunity to capture an impact on the build environment, like are there people, organizations, professionals out there that would love to see that, like that w- just want to understand what happened, you know, whether they're say emergency management people or insurance professionals or scientists <clears throat> or are there people that are in, in recent years, you know, curious of those pictures of extreme weather impacting the build environment? That Yeah, that's a good point. There are people who are fascinated, both engineers and, and safety planners, with, for example, storm surge and how it how it acts around other structures. That's one of the things I really am focused on right now is the storm surge and how other buildings may affect it, the friction of them uh, preventing waves on top of waves or the way that water flows between buildings. I find that extremely fascinating. Unfortunately, there's probably no way to incorporate that into warnings, but what I've, I'll give you a great example. Um, when you see a hurricane come into an area that has a lot of tall structures, very sturdy, stru- uh, you know, the, the uh, condos, those types of big buildings, it has a tendency to slow the water down as it comes in. And you may still have flooding, but you don't have the waves and the buildings are going to remain un- in- intact. Fortunately, we haven't seen any of those undermined and collapsed. So it's fascinating to watch that during a hurricane, how that stops the wave action. And then the areas that are open, the water flows freely. You have more of a, of a flooding. So I think eventually storm surge will have to be looked at on a localized basis as to, to what kind of warnings you issue or how you evacuate people. But I think we're a long way from there now because it's just, it's just too big of an area. Well, Warren, that's fascinating. I know a lot of chasers are filming and and photographing palm trees blowing in the wind, less a lot, many less people actually document a storm surge. It sounds like you're saying you've seen some really interesting patterns with that as far as how the, the water behaves, how that can maybe obstruct wave action. And um, it sounds like there can be some really localized Im- like effects of the build environment when you're in a surge zone. Yeah, absolutely. If you take an area that uh, like Fort Myers Beach, where I tried to stay the night before the hurricane hit, but I couldn't quite find the right place. You saw a lot of extreme damage and death in that area because the waves came in. There was no friction. There were there were few built substantial buildings right on that coastline that would stop that wave action. So I think it's we're at the point where when their buildings are engineered, they have to be engineered, of course, for safety, but they also have to be engineered with the idea of blocking wave action to be actual barriers because in areas where you have those tall buildings where i was a little bit further south you didn't have that wave action you had flooding but the structures that were on the other side of those large condominiums survived and that's probably something people need to think about in the future is using the building the actual engineering of those buildings to prevent some of the wave action which is extremely destructive Warren, I talked to survivors of Hurricane Michael in 2018 who said they watched houses float away in the storm surge, but they were protected because they were their small house was right behind a large hotel. And you could actually see some of these patterns. It sounds like what you're saying, if, if you're right behind a large building, perhaps your house was saved, but the house across the street might be gone. Yes, that's true. And the, but the big problem is, again, people are still going to have problems with flooding. So it's not an end all to, to the problem of a storm surge, but it does reduce some of the, some of the inland wave action, but it is something to con- consider. Again, when you have flooding, you're going to have people that are going to find themselves sure. in that surge when it gets above the, the house. And that's still a problem. No wave action is going to hurt anything there. It's already, it's already flooded. So it's, it's just something to kind of think about. I think when people are thinking about future engineering, yeah, that's right. Like you said, everyone probably in those zones is going to be impacted by the flooding, but maybe a little wet, less wave action some places than others. Yeah. Um, Warren, how I, there have to be so many changes in the profession. <clears throat> we were talking about how technology has changed. I mean, what are some other of the big changes you've seen since you started your career? Well, the big ones, of course, would be having radar in the palm of your hand. That is insane. I mean, we, we, I can imagine the, the tornadoes I would have seen if I had that ability back in the late eighties and nineties, because it was all visual. You had to just pick a storm and go for it. You didn't necessarily know that three storms over the storm, storm looked twice as good on radar. 
that's one thing, uh, weather data, of course, now being able to have, again, weather data on a laptop or on your cell phone. And the other big thing, probably the biggest thing to me is, of course, cell phones. Everybody or anybody now can be a, be a storm photographer with a cell phone and take a pretty decent picture. That's that's the big changes in, in technology. And of course, the other thing is changes is just the popularity of storm chasing. Who would have dreamed that it would become this social media sensation that it has become? Yeah, you're right, right? Not only capturing the storms, but the platform to share that. And then like you said, the, the weather technology that it's so much easier to find these storms compared to what it was back in the day. Uh, Warren, what would you say is your favorite type of weather to photograph? Probably the, the thing I enjoy photographing the most nowadays would have to be hurricanes. Hurricanes, uh, the planes are so saturated with people and there's so many tornado images nowadays that it's kind of lost its luster. I still enjoy the chase. I still enjoy meeting my friends in the planes. I still enjoy the landscapes and the hunt out there. But I'd say over the years, hurricanes have become my favorite beast of, of storms to, to go after. That is definitely my priority. You know they're there. You know they're going to hit. You can see them coming. And it's, it's a lot more stress as far as the logistics and planning where you want to be and being in the right place. But definitely tropical weather is, is my main focus nowadays. Well, the amount of time to get out there, uh, you know, a hurricane chase is sometimes days or even more than a week, actually. It sounds like um, a lot of the tornado chasers, they might just go out for an afternoon sometimes. Yeah, the thing about tornado chasing is if you live out there, you, you know, you're a lucky SOB. You can just go and you live there in Amarillo or you live in Oklahoma City. It's not a big deal. But when you're coming from, from Tucson, uh, it's also a very expensive venture. And I tell people the average hurricane chase is somewhere between uh, anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000 for me when, when I have to fly or drive in. There's hotels, there's gas, there's all these other expenses that go into it. So for me, it's, it's a big decision to spend that much money to sure. go chase something since I'm, I'm self-funded. I don't, I don't get money from any other source. So it's, it's a big deal. So at the same time, it makes me pretty picky about what I chase. Yeah, that makes sense. You're coming from the Southwest where you're living in Arizona. It's it's a distance to get out to the plains or and then even especially to get to the Gulf Coast or the Southeast Atlantic for a hurricane chase. Yep. Um, what, what about uh, photographing events in the Southwestern states there? Like I'd imagine you've done some photography there with desert monsoons and um, Arroyo flooding, things like that. I mean, what are do any events stand out to you from Arizona, New Mexico, the Southwest? Yeah, that's one thing is we're able to get revenge on the, the tornado chasers during the summer months here because we do have the monsoon and the haboobs, the big dust storms and, and the amazing lightning here, which is one of the reasons I, I stayed here over the years. We love, still love to shoot lightning. We don't have as many storms as we used to here. It's climate change has changed some of that. But there's so many events here in the Southwest I've chased over the years from wildfires to, to flooding back in the, in the late eighties, all those events, you know, the Southwest is not without severe weather. People think, Oh, it's pretty boring out here, but actually it's not during the monsoon. We have some tremendous storms out here. Oh, sure. Yeah. And they're, they're just so photogenic, you know, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, I've seen some of your shots and it just, it's amazing. It's like, wow, you just want to blow this up and put it on your wall. <laughs> Warren, uh, you know, the first time I met you, you were talking about some of these storm chases and storm surge zones f to kind of a housekeeping note for our listeners. Storm surge is really the deadliest, most destructive natural hazard on the planet. At least you can make that argument. You're in there in a surge zone trying to document this. But you mentioned that you also have these different precautions you take to protect yourself. Uh, you, you, Like you said, you're a trained EMT. You know your way around uh, protecting yourself and others. What are some of these precautions you take when you're in, say, a storm surge zone or an extreme flood zone? Well, the first thing I do is I have a, a self-inflating vest I wear in case I end up in the storm surge, which has happened and it has auto inflated. And I think when that thing pops, when it auto inflates, it's scarier than the water sometimes when you don't expect it. But <clears throat> I, I, I'm very picky about where I stay. I try to stay in a structure that I, I'm 90% sure will survive the storm surge. That's the number one thing. I also take with me enough food and, and supplies to make it through a few days if I have to. I'm very careful about uh, any kind of 
cuts or, or any type of injuries out there. There's a lot of bad stuff floating around in that, in that water, which is becoming a big problem. So I take all kinds of precautions. I, I if I go out in the storm surge, I, I use a probe to make sure there's no open manhole covers. I, I pre-plan these areas before I go out. So I kind of know where if there's a culvert or if there's a, if there's an opening I could be, be taken down into by the, by the water. There's just a lot of work that goes into pre-planning these areas. And I would say that's the most, it's actually more stressful. The pre-planning is more stressful than the actual hurricane. I, I can honestly say that to be, to be there, to make the right decision where you want to be, it can be nerve wracking when you have a hurricane, especially if it's, if it's kind of moving in a weird direction. That is the most stressful part. Once the hurricane hits, I can just take a deep breath and relax because I, I hopefully I've made the right decision on, on where I'm going to be. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of information to process in a short amount of time with where to position yourself. And then once you get out there, it sounds like it, you just kind of get into the flow of the storm and, and settle in and, and it's a little less stressful then. Yeah. A lot of hurricane chasers, I would say probably 90% of them like to chase in their cars, which, which I can understand you're, you're mobile, you're able to move around, but I think that's a real false sense of security because a, you have stuff float flying around B you can't be in the storm surge in a car. And so it's, it's kind of risky to be driving around as we've seen recently with people, <clears throat> excuse me, we've seen recently with people just driving around kind of trying to find the most extreme winds and debris flying around while in a car. I just, that's just not for me. I want to be in a location. If I can be mobile and move around in that location with different perspectives as a photographer, that's great. But I want to be in the storm. I want to, I want to be able to see everything going around when it comes to that surge. And I don't want to be stuck, stuck in a car somewhere. So Warren, if you're not getting in, in a car, like how do you get into position? Will someone drop you off? Will you, uh, hitch a ride, Uber, like how, how do you get to the place yeah. you're going and, and then, you know, set up for the arrival of the storm? Well, I have two techniques. One is to find a substantial building like a parking garage or a condominium, something where you can park that's A, likely to survive and B, you can get the vehicle out because a lot of times the the driveways, the ramps are washed away. That's the first method. The second method is is more what I call the commando method. And that is to actually take an Uber in with enough supplies and equipment and be dropped off at a location that's very fortified. I, I don't really care if it's, it's not completely covered, but something that will survive. So that's, there's, there's two options there to, to be able to chase. So like in a worst case scenario, if there's no parking garage, you might, I'm guessing maybe find a large hotel or something like that, where you could like get up and, and, get maybe slightly above the water, but also probably you're thinking about the wind direction and maybe shielding yourself. And, and uh, probably ideally you're watching the, the wind and the world go by, but you're, you have some level of protection, I'd imagine. Yeah. Well, that option B of the, what I call the commando chasing it, there's, there's some stealth and some, you know, a little bit of trickery in there to find the right place and not get kicked out and, and, and have all the, the equipment you need and, and supplies for a couple of days, but that's becoming more of an option nowadays because they're doing a lot better job of securing these areas. And I think part of it's just, they're able to do it nowadays that the law enforcement's able to get in and kick everybody out and they don't care if I'm a journalist, they're going to kick me out. So I'm going to do anything I have to do to stay, stay in there. And of course, nowadays there's more security concerns than there was 20, 30 years ago. So a lot of the, the garages, the one I rode Hurricane Andrew out in now is completely fenced. You, you cannot get sure. in there uh, without bolt cutters, which I would never consider carrying bolt cutters to get into the perfect location. That's just, I would never do that. Warren, I've heard of a lot of cases in hurricanes where someone evacuates, they come home to a destroyed house, they submit their insurance claim to the flood insurance and a flood insurance says, oh no, part of your roof is gone. This is homeowners, send it to them. So they say, oh, okay. So they send it to homeowners instead of flood insurance and homeowner says, oh no, you had three feet of storm surge. We don't cover it. So it becomes the, the homeowners and the flood insurance fighting out, you know, sometimes litigation to figure out which came first, basically the flooding or the wind. I could see the work you're doing on the field being a huge benefit to a lot of these communities, right? If you're, if you're documenting what happened through the storm, I would imagine in, in some communities, 
your your perspective as a professional could be very valuable to maybe settle some of these claims and just understand really what happened when the storm hit. Well, that's a good point. And what I suggest to everyone, you have a lot of people moving into Florida, for example. If you look at the the number of new residents, it's insane. It's it's skyrocketed along the coast. Very important to go through your insurance line by line and understand those what it's saying as far as your coverage goes. You need to know the things like you were mentioning about if the flooding occurs or the wind occurs. That's all in your policy. and You really need to go over that line by line and understand that. You have a lot of options for insurance and it's much easier beforehand to figure that out and go with the right insurance and find out afterward you're not you're not covered. Ask ask your neighbors what what insurance they have and, and especially in areas that have already been struck before. Talk to those people and find out what their experiences were like and who they use. There are some exceptional insurance companies out there that will offer excellent coverage. And then again, there's some where you have those those fine lines where you could end up in a lot of trouble. Warren, that's a great perspective, right? You can't stop the storm from coming, but there are things homeowners can do to get out ahead of this. Make sure they're properly insured. Make sure they understand their policy. And like you said, talk to your neighbors. And especially if you're new to an area, they may say, hey, go with this company and not this other company. Yeah. And it also matters how the house was built. The certain areas in the building codes, find those things out before you move there and, and you insure your house. And then this is especially true along along any coastal areas for 100 or 200 miles inland where you're going to have these high winds and, and, and flooding sometimes. It's really important to look at those insurance policies. Even here in Arizona, I live four or 500 feet from a dry wash, but FEMA requires that I have flood insurance. So I make sure that I have not only have flood insurance, but I have it to cover the whole the whole value of, of my home. Those are the kind of things you really need to find out in advance and shop around and make the right decisions. Warren, when you're in an extreme weather environment, are you, is the phone on silent? You're just, you know, you're just there with nature, just in the moment, just photographing it. Or are you off, often connected with other professionals that are maybe helping guide where you go or saying, hey, we could use a photograph like this. I mean, what does it look like when you're there in the field? Do you have communication with other professionals or often are you kind of cutting that off so you can just focus on, on mother nature? I do talk to other uh, chasers, people I respect, people have been chasing for many years when I'm out there. We trade notes about where we're going, what we've seen, you know, how the gas stations are, are, are doing, what locations we, we've spotted. We share that information with each other. Again, it's, it's such a crazy critical time within that, that 12 hours before the storm hits and that the conditions start to deteriorate. It's good to have options. I'll call a guy that's a little further north and he'll say, yeah, I found this perfect building. And I'll say, well, I've got one down south in case the storm shifts a little bit. And you can come down here and the roads are clear and you can get through. So, yeah, it's very important to, to trade information. I have a handful of people I do do that with. I also look at a lot of social media. I look at transportation department reports all these these crazy things tv news is really good really important a lot of people don't realize that but your local tv coverage during these storms some of those some of the newscasters are, are incredibly good because they've been through a number of, of big storms all that information is all dissimilated you become the borg during these events where i'm totally focused on information at that point where I'm going to stay, the engineering of what may survive or what won't. So it's a complete focus. And again, when the storm's going on, you know, I could kick back and, and talk to someone about the you know, price of tea in China. It's, it's a totally different environment once the storm's going on. I find that to be the most relaxing time unless something insane's going on. If I'm in a building being battered by a by a 20 foot storm surge, I'm probably going to be more focused on on uh, what I'm going to do next or how to survive. But it's 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 a it's an all encompassing event when a storm hits of, of the pre storm during the storm and also after the storm. We don't talk a lot about after the storm, but that's also a very stressful, dangerous time. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. So what happens? There's you're in a cat four hurricane. You were, <laughs> you know, really focused on positioning correctly. You you optimally, you, you got in a good spot, you documented the storm, and now it's the day after the storm. What does your life look like then? Well, the period right after a storm, 
generally there, there are some photographic opportunities as a journalist and, and I do look for those, but as an EMT and sometimes the only person with any medical experience in a location, this happens almost during every storm. People come out and say, uh, Last hurricane I was at, someone came out and said someone was having a heart attack. People have sorted injuries. People, a lot of people are missing. A lot of people need information. So I kind of turn into this jack of all post storm trades where it's a little bit EMS, it's a little bit journalist, and a little bit uh, just compassion for what's happened and, and be kind of sensitive to that. And one of the things I do too is, is animal rescue. If there's no people, if it's completely void, uh, if I find an animal in distress, a uh, turtle that's been washed into a pool, I'll, I'll take it back out in the ocean, let it go. Uh, sometimes you find cats, dogs that are lost or, or, or trapped. So it just depends on the situation, but that period afterwards always just, it's kind of a whole different world. Well, and from what I've heard, there's all kinds of health problems that can happen after the storm. People have lacerations. It might be building, like you said, or bleeding. Like you said, they may have had heart attacks. Um, in, in some cases too, you had mentioned before about if you have open wounds exposed to flood water, what are the dangers with that? Well, the Vibrio virus, uh, the bacteria, excuse me, is is the big danger after a storm. Now, we're seeing numbers of people that are infected go through the roof and the death counts kind of alarming after storms. There was a volunteer after Hurricane Irma that went home and, and passed away from it. So you need to really be careful in, in especially along the Gulf and even the, the East Coast to if you have any kind of wound, you want to clean the heck out of it. You want to keep an eye on it. Even the smallest wound where that bacteria can get in there, you want to make sure that you A, clean it and keep an eye on it. If it starts to turn red or you have any other uh, signs or symptoms, you really want to get a med get to a medical facility as soon as possible. People can actually end up in the ICU uh, from some of these, these bacteria infections within 48 hours. It's a very fast acting type of, of emergency once it's infected. So that's something you want to really pay attention to as much as you do electrical power lines or, or stepping on glass or dangerous driving through dangerous intersections. You have to kind of start getting your mindset that there are a lot of, of, of natural dangers, including bacteria infections after these storms. Yeah, I've heard even like animal bites. Uh, sometimes animals get displaced, get stressed. Um, you'll get uh, snakes, fire ants, all kinds of things right in that flood water. Yeah, the people have said they've seen balls of fire ants. I guess they roll up into a ball to survive. Of course, I wouldn't want to be the ant on the bottom of that pile, but they, they apparently roll. People have seen them roll around the water. You would not want to have one of those hit you. That would be. Oh, the, yeah. You know, during a Hurricane Gustav field work, I got some fire ant bites that just really blew up. And an entomologist told me their venom levels go through the roof when they're stressed. And so that's another thing a lot of people might not realize that that fire ant bite you get may have more venom, I think, than, than usual if they're stressed out. Yeah. And of course, the ants usually send a signal to all bite at once. And you got to remember if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have a, of a reaction you may not be able to find an EpiPen or something that, that could save your life. Again, you got to kind of remember after the storms, you're isolated. You may not be able to call in medical help right away. If someone's having a heart attack, they may need some aspirin. Uh, if they have their own medication, you can help them. But those types of things, you're going to have a delayed response. And you have to kind of remember that uh, when these things are, are, are going on, that there is going to be a delayed response and you have to be careful not to injure yourself because it, it, it's not going to be the normal situation. Well, Warren, I'm, I'd imagine when you're out there in the field, you have a pretty robust first aid kit and, and supply kit, not only for yourself, but for people that you're, you're coming across out there. I carry as much medical equipment as I, as I can. A lot of times after hurricanes, it, it seems that there's, there's two types of, of people you find. You find people who, who have stress related injury or like heart attacks or they're having difficulty breathing because they're stressed out. Of course, you find the deceased. Uh, you don't find that many injured people, as you would say, in a, in a tornado where you have the wind fields with a lot of debris lying around. You find some entrapments. You find people who are trapped on their roof. You find people who are dehydrated. You find a lot of elderly people with a whole host of issues, diabetic issues, uh, mobility issues of getting out of areas that are flooded, those types of, of things, which a lot of them can be handled 
just with common sense and a little bit of a little bit of compassion but you just never know and that's one of the things when i'm out there i have to have to kind of mentally prepare myself for is you just you never know what sure. you're going to see yeah that's true it's pretty unknown you don't know what you're going to find when you're out there warren any advice for other storm chasers for other journalists any anything that's helped your chances of being able to stay out there when you come across security people that that ask who you are what you're doing any any advice because some sometimes they're just adamant you got to leave sometimes they don't care but a lot of them seem to be gray like if you say the right thing you could maybe stay in the storm zone any uh, any tricks that you have well i don't really have tricks usually my emt credentials they'll they'll let me stay that's one of the great things about doing that i've actually volunteered to stay in hotels uh, large hotels and be the the medical advisor, if you will. And they'll let me stay there because of that. And there's other situations where, again, it's it's basically a, a commando type stealth operation where you just have to go in and do the best you can not to really mislead anybody. But as a journalist, sometimes you have to you have to use a little bit of that that trickery to get into the area. The, the, the law enforcement, they don't really have time to to sit there. Sure. They're sure. doing their job. They have a hard job. They don't have time to, to sort everyone out. And I recognize that. But I also have a job and, and, and really nothing's going to stop me from getting into the right location. Warren, what advice would you have for high school students, college students? They want to maybe emulate you. They want to go down a similar path. What advice would you give them? Sorry about that. I had a <clears throat> my screen went off. You want to ask that question again? <laughs> oh, yeah. Warren, uh, what advice would you give for high school students, college students that, that maybe want to get into this line of work that they're fascinated about extreme weather and photography? Uh, what are some things they can be thinking about as they make professional choices? I think if you want to be a storm chaser, if you want to get involved in, in something to do with weather, <clears throat> try to find a pathway that's not chasing. Because the problem with chasing is there's not a lot of opportunities to make a living. When you're young, you know, you can get by with a lot. You're not really that picky. But when you get older, you're going to want to have somewhat of a comfortable life. You're not going to want to be living out of the back of a, of a Motel 6. So find a job that relates to chasing or find a job that pays well and lets you take the time off to go chasing when you want, when you can take two or three weeks off a year uh, at your leisure. That's a much better option. Find something that you enjoy, really enjoy doing it, even if it's not chasing and, and build from there and look at your retirement someday to be able to go out and chase full time if you want. That's much better advice than I, I think than, than trying to just live in poverty and chase, although that's fine. Some people are happy with that and I admire them for that. But there are jobs that are related to chasing in meteorology and in, in science, in, in news work, in EMS work that relate to disaster response, things like that. So there are a lot more options than there used to be. But the good thing, the thing to do is to think through it first and decide you know, the lifestyle that you want in the long run, because that's going to really dictate how your future sets up with storm chasing. Yeah, Warren, that's really good advice. I, a friend of mine comes to comes to mind, lives near the Texas Oklahoma border, is fascinated with storm chasing, but works in insurance <laughs> services and insurance adjusting, right? So they can do some chasing and then stay out and do some some home evaluations after the storm. So kind of what you said there, merging a professional career with the passion for chasing. Yeah, I've, I've actually spoken to people who who kind of lived in poverty chasing and now they're in their 50s and they regret it. They, they regret they have no retirement. They have no life. Uh, they may have lost some of the interest in chasing and they're very bitter. And some, some of them are very bitter because they didn't make better life choices because you realize there there's only a few people that are going to make money chasing. There's a handful of people on social media and that's always changing. So there's no guarantee that's going to last past, you know, next year or something. And there's more and more chasers every year. There, There's AI imaging and footage coming out now, which is going to affect, which is going to affect that industry. So nothing's guaranteed. But the, the main thing with chasing is to have fun, chase when you can, but but don't sacrifice, I, I think, your your livelihood for it, because I think someday you might actually be pretty disappointed. Warren, I think that's that's excellent advice. You know, we know there are thousands of chasers out there. And like you said, only a few really get good funding. So it, it's really a flooded market. Like you said, it can be a great hobby and you can find peripheral ways, but don't put a, all your hopes in, in being a professional chaser if, if you're one of these young folks. Yep. 
Um, Warren, how can people find your work? How can how can people find you, uh, see the work that you've done, and and uh, find you online? Best place to go is uh, to find out about my work is to go to stormchaser.com. There's links there to everything from prints to coffee mugs to to images. There's a lot of high resolution images you can look at there. Stories, biography, all kinds of crazy videos, things like that. So stormchaser.com is your one stop point to go to, to learn more about what I do. That's great, Warren. Any any last thoughts or insights you'd like to share with our listeners? I know they're going to love this uh, this episode. No, the main thing is just enjoy weather. En- enjoy it. Uh, learn about it. Chase it. Try to have as uh, the least negative effect on other people. If you're you're chasing, things can get crazy out there. And, and for younger people, please don't try to emulate some of the crazy people you see on YouTube doing things like that, risking their lives. It's it's a lot more dangerous than it looks. It's not worth life or your limb or hurting someone else. Uh, to drive into a tornado. Young people need to know that you can do this, have a lot of fun, have a lot of adventure, but but don't do some of the crazy stuff you see because uh, there have been people killed doing it. And it's just not, it's not worth your life. There's always going to be another storm. And it's, it's, it's something you can enjoy for the rest of your life. Like I've done, I've had many, many dangerous in, encounters that are absolutely off the, the charts. But I also have a preservation gene thanks somewhere inside that, that keeps has kept me alive and I'm still doing it. So that's my best advice. So it sounds like maybe taking calculated risks, not crossing that line to being reckless, but saying, how can we get out there, enjoy Mother Nature, but, uh, but not go over that line and into recklessness? Yep, that's a good way to put it. Warren, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your stories. I mean, it was such an inspiration to hear how you got started and how your profession has changed through the years. And I'm telling you, uh, first, I've been in 19 hurricanes and very few people, if anyone, really goes into the, the surge zone like you do. And um, I just think that work is so valuable because it's one of the most destructive hazards. You're there really documenting it. And I think it's just a, a huge asset to to both our science, but also learning how to better, better engineer and protect people on the coast. So thanks for your work and thanks for taking time to come on the podcast. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Warren, for sharing your adventures and your insights with us over decades of experience doing photojournalism, storm chasing, and, and all kinds of really interesting explorations. Warren touched on some really key things that are so important for for photojournalists, storm chasers, and people in harm's way from extreme weather. A couple of these things that really stood out to me. Number one had to do with the storm chase community. We know that a lot of people get really passionate about extreme weather. They want to get out there and see it for themselves. They want to photograph it. They want to share it on social media, take videos and and share stories. They want to experience extreme nature. And uh, that's really awesome. It's a great hobby. It's something I've been passionate about since I'm a little kid. But Warren mentioned really for storm chasers to be careful that you're not in the way obstructing other people's escape routes, obstructing the access of emergency responders. It can get pretty crowded, especially I would say in the plains in the springtime, tornado chasing, severe weather chasing, it becomes a really popular thing. And when you get a, a high profile storm, a lot of times you'll find dozens or even, you know, Uh, at least dozens of chasers out there really uh, trying to race for the scene. And sometimes it can get crowded. You just want to make sure that you're not actually adding uh, more burden for the local population, whether, again, that's, that's blocking transportation routes, obstructing emergency service vehicles, things like that. You just want to be careful. And Warren even mentioned that he almost prefers going to some of these events that are are less popular uh, just because of the crowds there on the, pl- on the plains in the springtime. So really uh, interesting insights and I think valuable lessons there and wisdom from Warren with that. Number two, and this isn't really for storm chasers, this is more for people that live in harm's way, especially flood prone areas, hurricane prone areas, Warren mentioned make sure that, making sure that your insurance is in order, making sure that you're properly covered with insurance, that you understand your policy, that you reviewed your policy. He mentioned in some areas, you talk to people on the ground. They'll say certain carriers do really well with providing services after and others not so well. So make sure that you do your homework, especially if you're new to flood-prone areas or hurricane-prone areas. Keep in mind, too, a lot of people assume that homeowners insurance will cover their flood damage. And in many cases, it won't. You need separate flood insurance for that. And so often people have multiple policies, one for flood, one for wind. And uh, you just really have to be on top of that. Make sure that your contents are covered. I've talked to people in flood zones a lot who say we were paying this premium for 
decades, and we assumed that our contents were covered, but they were not. So our furniture, our appliances, none of it was covered because they didn't read the fine print or their insurance agent did not really explain and educate them with that. So make sure you know what's going on in your insurance policy. Make sure that you have documented, taken photographs of your possessions. If you've added an addition to your house, make sure that's all photographed. Make sure you have receipts in watertight bags that are, or, you know, that you can trans- transport out of the scene of a disaster. We just want to make sure that you're properly insured and that you're protecting those documents. It's great to have digital copies of all that as well. If you can have them backed up on the cloud, on Google Docs, anything like that, you want to be able to get back on your feet as soon as a disaster hits. So really good uh, perspective there from Warren as well. Warren mentioned about the danger of water. So we've all seen the power of Mother Nature. We know that fast flowing flood water can sweep away buildings, can sweep away cars and people. The force of water is unbelievable. I mean, carry an empty gallon of water up a flight of stairs and then fill that gallon jug with water and you can feel the difference. Water is very heavy and these big floods are moving billions of gallons of water up against our built environment. So we know that that's a danger, but a hidden danger with flooding is that often what's in the water, the, the bacteria, the chemicals, you see people all the time walking through flood water. This can really be dangerous for a couple reasons. Warren talked about Vibrio. This is a bacteria that's very common in warm seawater, warm brackish water. So you don't even need to be in an urban area. You could just be on an open coast, say in a bay, documenting a a flood event. And if you have warm brackish water or seawater that comes in contact with an open wound, you can actually get this Vibrio bacteria that essentially enters your bloodstream. And it can be really serious. It can make you very sick. And in some cases, it can actually be fatal. So really be careful of that if you're out there documenting storms or if your community is impacted by a storm. Also, we need to be concerned about flooding in urban and suburban settings. Every time I'm documenting a flood like that, I'll see people with flip-flops or Crocs just walking through ankle-deep flood water. Keep in mind, when urban flooding hits, a lot of times there's very contaminated water. You can have chemicals in the water. The sewage can back up. And again, if you have an open cut, you can, you can have a lot of nasty chemicals directly enter your bloodstream. So if you're walking around in flood water, try to have high rubber boots uh, or just try to avoid the flood water if at all possible. So that's something that blindsides a lot of people. Again, the force of the water is one thing, but the chemicals and the, the the chemistry of this water can be very dangerous if it enters an open wound. I'm really glad that Warren mentioned that. Um, Also, you know, I really thought it was cool, Warren's perspective on enjoying extreme weather, right? We don't have to apologize for that. It is amazing to see, uh, look at Warren's uh, work that he's done with lightning and with tornadoes. I mean, he's covered all kinds of extreme weather. It's just, it's beautiful and it's awe-inspiring and it's amazing. I like how Warren talked about, there's a fine line though, where we can cross from, taking calculated risk to becoming reckless. And that's what we want to avoid. You want to really keep your situational awareness out there. You know, we, when you're driving around a storm environment, keep keep alert for large trees. I've seen billboards snapped off in winds that are not even hurricane force. That'll just crush a car. So you really want to think about where you are, electric lines, again, flowing water, all these things can get you in a bad situation really quickly. And keep in mind that Warren is a professional with this. He's a trained EMT. He's a disaster survival specialist. And he's on the ground with, you know, a first aid kit and other supplies and know-how that he can help himself if he gets injured or threatened in some way, and he can also help others. Uh, Keep in mind that these disasters can get really bad really quickly. And all of a sudden, if you find yourself in harm's way, if you don't have the training or any first aid kit with you or any way to to treat a wound, for example, you, you yourself can get into trouble really quickly and even tax some health infrastructure that's already taxed. You could be an injured person adding to the burden of the local population. So just really good perspectives there from Warren. Again, I'd I'd encourage you to check out his work online. Amazing photography. He's been doing this for a long time, capturing events really, you know, since the the end of last century and uh, pretty cool stuff to see him out there. Um, I met him at the National Tropical Weather Conference in person in April, and I know we're both part of that community. Um, And, you know, being involved in 
in an extreme weather community like that, you're going to meet some really interesting people. So Warren, thank you again for coming on the podcast. Really great to follow your work. We'll have to see if you get that out there in a hurricane this year. I know you like covering hurricanes, but if not, I know we'll find you covering all kinds of extreme weather all over the country and, and beyond. It sounds like you've done some work nationally and internationally covering all kinds of extreme weather. Y'all, thanks so much for tuning into the podcast. We try to bring you experts and uh, professionals that deal with all kinds of extreme weather from different angles. We've never had someone quite like Warren come on the podcast before, and we're really appreciative for his insights. Everyone have a great time uh, out there as you explore an adventure, and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode of the GeoTrek podcast.